Well, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome again to our continuing seminar series of the uh, Center for Emerging Cardiovascular Technology. It uh, gives me great pleasure today to introduce you Dr. and Professor Mark Buzinski from that other university on the East Coast, uh, sometimes known as Harvard and also associated with uh, MIT. And uh, uh, Professor Brzezinski is, uh, has an appointment both in electrical engineering at MIT and in cardiology. He's a cardiologist at MGH. And uh, this is uh, actually the second of our talks in, in this developing area of optical coherence tomography and, and optical methods as applied to medicine. And we're, we're very fortunate to have one of the pioneers in the field here today with us to talk about high resolution plaque characterization with optical coherence tomography, also known as OCT. Mark? Okay, first of all, we appreciate the opportunity of allowing our group to be represented here. Uh, Can you turn it on? Oh, could someone turn it on, please? That would help. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So today I'd like to talk about a uh, new method of high resolution imaging referred to as optical coherence tomography, or OCT. I'd like to begin by discussing the principles behind OCT in very basic uh, way and then go on to some of its applications, then move on to the technology and finally discuss some of the limitations in future efforts. OCT is analogous to ultrasound, measuring the intensity of back-reflected infrared light rather than acoustical waves. This slide shows how OCT measures distances on a micron scale. Ultra-short light pulses or low coherent light is generated at the sample. The time for the light to be reflected back or echo delay time is used to measure distances in a manner analogous to ultrasound. The intensity of back reflection is plotted as a function of depth. The beam is then scanned across the sample to produce two and three dimensional data sets. As you know, unlike ultrasound, the delay time cannot be measured electronically due to the high speeds associated with the propagation of light. Therefore, low coherence interferometry is used, which I'll discuss later on in the talk. OCT was originally developed by my partners, Eric Swanson and James Fujimoto, to image the transparent tissue of the eye at unprecedented resolutions. Humphrey's Instruments has subsequently commercialized the device where it's being used in a wide range of retinal macular diseases. I've been working with Jim Fujimoto now for five years on developing OCT for imaging in non-transparent tissue. And the reasons why we think it will be useful include its high resolution, which is currently between 4 and 16 microns, its broad dynamic range of 109 decibels, which is at the shot noise limit, its compact portable design, its fiber-based design, which allows ready integration with catheters and endoscopes that can be made very small, it's at or near real-time imaging. We're currently at eight frames per second and believe video rate will be present in the near future. It's inexpensive and can be combined with other modalities. Applications in general, OCT imaging gem demonstrates its greatest potential in situations where conventional biopsy cannot be performed or is ineff ineffective. Since this is a cardiology session, I'm gonna focus on its cardiovascular applications. Starting off with coronary artery disease, there's two areas in coronary artery disease where we believe there's a big role for OCT. The first is in improving patient risk stratification, and I don't know how familiar you are with plaque rupture, but uh, myocardial infarction is the acute loss of blood flow to a region of the heart resulting in that death to that heart tissue. It's the leading cause of death in the industrialized world. Most heart attacks are caused by the rupture of small, thin-walled plaques in the arteries of the heart, which cannot be detected by any currently available imaging technology. These plaques represent less than 20% of the lumen. They release fat into the bloodstream, a clot forms, and the vessel occludes. Therefore, a true clinical need exists for an imaging technology capable of identifying the plaques which cause most of the heart attacks. In addition, when we think of interventional procedures like angioplasty and stenting, these are real, really microsurgical procedures being guided by the macroscopic imaging technology fluoroscopy. Uh, 
I'm not going to go into great clinical detail, but I just wanted to show this one slide. This isn't from our group, it's from Rich Lee's group, but what we're looking at here basically is the likelihood of a plaque rupturing versus the intimal wall thickness. And it can be seen that when the intimal wall thickness, that's the cap over the fat, is less than 100 to 200 microns in diameter, the likelihood that this plaque will rupture and lead to a heart attack is much greater. Um, when you think of this with respect to high frequency ultrasound at 30 megahertz, which is the current clinical technology of, with the highest resolution, that's an axial resolution of 110 microns or one pixel. Therefore, it suggests that high frequency ultrasound will not be able to identify these lesions. So I'm going to show you some in older in vitro data first. What we're looking at is atherosclerotic aortic plaque. The top is the OCT image, the bottom is the histopathology. The plaque is on the left, the normal tissue on the right. The most significant, uh, in all the images, the bar is 500 microns. The most significant feature is shown by the green arrow, which is a layer of intimal cap, which is what we were talking about, less than 50 microns in diameter. Again, this slide, also older, shows the ability of OCT to identify these high-risk plaques, which can't be identified with any other technology. What we're looking at is a collection of lipid within the wall of the blood vessel and a thin intimal wall. What happens is when the heart contracts, pressure comes in from the top, the plaque ruptures from the site and releases this fat, which causes a clot. In the second image, we're looking at a, an area that looked no, relatively normal from the surface, but fissuring is occurring to the intimal medial border, which is another indication of instability at that site. Now, we've compared pretty extensively OCT with IVIS. This is a slightly older image, and I'll show you new ones in a second. The right is a 30 megahertz CVIS transducer of a coronary artery. The left is done with a first generation OCT imaging catheter. There's intimal hyperplasia or thickening of the intima, which is clearly identified with OCT but is not seen in the AVIS image. Now, comparing those with plaque, which is actually a little bit more relevant, we were in the early days worried we wouldn't be able to penetrate through the plaque. These are the AVIS images, these are the OCT images. You can see we can follow the media all around and identify the width of the plaque in each area which is very difficult to discern in the IVIS or high frequency ultrasound image. And I, this is a little bit out of sequence, but I wanted to make a point. Those were all hard plaques on the previous images. And then besides identifying the plaque at high resolution, we want to characterize it. Now this opening just happens to be the size of the artery, so you don't see the lumen. But the hard area, the soft area, and the normal tissue are clearly differentiated in the OCT image, which you would not be able to do with ultrasound. One final comparison, ultrasound, OCT, histopathology. We're looking at a layer of smooth muscle proliferation identified within the wall, which cannot be identified in the IVIS image. I just want to go into some loose ends before going into interventional OCT. So those comparisons we saw, this is a plaque now that's been reconstructed in 3D, and the normal tissue has been subtracted out. This was done manually, but we currently have a program ongoing to do this in an automated fashion. But you can see that the fine structure of the plaque is sharply identified. Also, just to demonstrate the ability to identify fine structure deep within the tissue, this is a basement membrane, which is important in the progression of atherosclerosis within the artery. And you can see that the basement membrane is clearly identified in this artery with intimal hyperplasia. In vivo imaging, this is going to be imaging in a rat rabbit model. What we did is performed a mid-abdominal incision, introduced the 7 French Judson catheter into the rabbit abdominal aorta, and then the 2.9 French OCT imaging catheter was introduced through the Judsons. The first images are done in the presence of saline flushes. And you can see that the media, there's very little intima in the rabbit aorta. This is done in real time. This is a digital image. It was also saved in super VHS format. That the structure within the wall of the rabbit aorta, which is normal, is defined. In addition, we can see the inferior vena cava through the wall and identify the adventitia. Now, blood is a high scatterer. And so on the bottom image, we can see that in the presence of blood, the previous image was done in the presence of a saline flush. 
that it pretty much obscures most of the image. In this image, the blood front is coming back into the picture, and we can see that there's loss of imaging behind the blood front. The good news was that the flushing was only at two to four cc's per second, which is less than or the same that we would use in a standard angiogram. Now, I'm going to just briefly discuss some of the interventional aspects. First, comparing OCT with RF ablation. RF, um, if I realize some of you may not be have a clinical background, we often put catheters up in the heart to ablate rhythm abnormalities. One of the most important is atrial fibrillation, which affects, I believe, about 30 or 40 percent of the population over the age of 60. The reason it's important is atrial fibrillation, which is basically the top chambers stop contracting, has a high incidence of stroke so that these patients need to be on Coumadin for life, which means they're coming back at regular intervals even a month, and it becomes very expensive on the healthcare system. If you can stop this rhythm by an ablative procedure, you could dramatically reduce the cost to the healthcare system in addition to improvements in the mortality. So what we want to do is when you put these RF catheters are to be able to determine how deeply it's occurring, but at the same time determine if there's excess damage, which is a problem. If you put, if you cause too deep of a burn on the left side of the heart, you create a focus, which can lead to strokes in that patient. And current techniques are really not very reliable. This is going to be goat myocardium, and we're going to induce lesions with at two to three watts, with a 500 kilohertz uh, catheter. The first is the left ventricle, and this phenomenon I'm going to come back to, but these columns are polarization-sensitive columns. You see this in myocardium. What happens is, is these areas, the backscattering intensity is sensitive to the uh, polarization state of the incident light. It was initially thought that this was birefringence, but since this is running up and down, you're getting an idea that there's probably two different orthogonal states, that it's filtering one of the two orthogonal states. Now, why that's important for us in guiding this RF ablation is you see that the first thing that changes as RF ablation begins is the loss of this polarization sensitivity. I assume that this is due to myosin and elastin, though collagen is a possibility, and in cartilage, collagen is the main cause, which is where the focus of our work is in this area. Now, after you've lost the polarization sensitive areas, you then see an increase in backscattering intensity until the tissue pops. So this suggests you'll be able to guide this procedure. Is that these are in vitro? These are in vitro, yeah. Um, the aor rabbit aorta was the in vivo image from this series. So this is the right ventricle. We see an increase in backscattering intensity. And then the right atrium, where we get distortion of the tissue and decrease in penetration. Now, one, the pulmonary vein and isthmus have become of interest because it's, uh, particularly after a recent New England Journal article, it's believed that if you ablate the, um, some certain tissue in the pulmonary vein, that you can block the atrial fibrillation cycle. So what we're looking at here is normal pulmonary vein and one that's undergone microwave ablation, and you can see that the structural damage within the tissue is sharply defined. Now, in addition to guiding the extent of damage, and this relates to your question in vivo, this experiment was done in a slightly different manner. This is the right ventricle pulmonary vein junction, and the ablation was performed on the rabbit on the pig first, and then we took out the sections and looked at them. And you'll notice there's really no correspondence between time and damage, and to a large extent there isn't a lot of damage, and the main reason for that is they weren't really in contact with the artery. And the problem is, since this is guided with fluoroscopy, you're not always in direct contact with the tissue. So not only do you need to guide it in terms of how dosimetry, but you need to actually make sure you're not floating in the middle of the bloodstream and not up against the wall. Laser ablation, I, people are interested in TMR, so we've looked at, this is a laser ablation in myocardium. First, this is a static image that was done after a three watt laser pulse from an argon laser can see that the crater is defined in addition to area and necrosis behind it. Now we reconstructed the same data set on FOSS and there, we've studied this with NBT staining to assess the cell viability and you'll notice you get rings which correspond to different levels of damage. The inner rings represent coagulation.
as the rings go out, the cells look normal by histology, but no longer are viable. And if they were given 24 to 48 hours, you'd see cell death. And then outer rings represent edema. This was done in real time, bovine muscle and chicken breast. And it's actually interesting relative to your absorption comments before. Bovine muscle, which has a lot of myoglobin, you can see that the damage is much greater. You can follow the damage front into the tissue in real time. With the chicken breast, since the myoglobin concentration is relatively low, even after nine seconds, we didn't see that much damage into the tissue. Developmental biology is another area of cardiology where uh, OCT has a potential application. Molecular and developmental biologists produce gene abnormalities in some models like zebrafish and xenopus, which uh, cause phenotypic changes which are often difficult to assess. For instance, if you've affected a gene that affects heart contraction, there's no good way of doing that other than sacrificing the animal and therefore losing the gene. So first, this is a series of images in the tadpole, and you can see that we're looking at the cycle of the tadpole heart. Uh, it, this is an embryo, and it is non-transparent. And we've actually induced changes in cardiac function. This was done by a student, Stephen Bopart, and he treated the animal with rapamil, which depressed cardiac function. And just like with an echo, we can measure changes in ejection fraction and other parameters of cardiac function. This isn't relevant to cardiology, but this is the neural tube, which is also important in developmental biology. Again, this is done in vivo like the last one. You can see we're identifying the neural tube structure looking for gene abnormalities. And Xenopus, which is another important animal model. This is Xenopus egg embryo embedded in paraffin. And over 14 hours, you can follow differentiation from occurring. I'm going to go into this in a little greater detail. This was done in vivo in a tadpole model, and you can see that this is now, all the previous images were roughly between 10 and 14 microns. This is at 4 microns, and it's true subcellular level imaging. You're seeing not only the cells, but the individual nuclei. Again, this one was done by Stephen Bopart, and you can follow the division of the cells um, through a cell cycle. He actually followed them for 24 hours. And I'd like to discuss the technology in a little bit greater detail. OCT, as you probably know from the last talk, is based on low coherence interferometry. A low coherence source is coupled into a fiber beam splitter. Half the light, half the light goes toward the sample. Half the light goes toward a mirror. Light reflects from within the sample and off of the mirror. In, if light in both arms travels the same optical path length, interference will occur in the detect at the detector. By using a low coherence source, interference will only occur if the path length difference between the two arms is within the coherence length of the source. By moving the reference arm, you're changing the path length in the reference arm and thereby changing where you're sampling information from within the tissue. You're also inducing a Doppler shift, which um, I'll explain a little later allows you to remove the 1O over F noise in the system. I'm going to describe the components in a modular fashion, the source, the catheter, the acquisition system. First, the catheter. Um, this is an older catheter, but it, it's of interest. This is one millimeter in diameter, 2.9 French. It consists of no transducer within its frame, unlike an un ultrasound catheter making it inexpensive. It's basically a single mode optical fiber, speedometer cable, grin lens, and microprism. The proximal end is a free space coupling, and we're down to 2.6 French. Sources, um, we've used a variety of sources over the years. Solid state lasers, and I'll show you an example of that in the next slide. Doped fibers, um, we've used them. They have problems associated with them. The spectrums tend not to be Gaussian. It's hard to get the appropriate bandwidth, and they're low power, and it's awful dif often difficult to find the appropriate pumping sources. Superluminescent diodes, we have human-based systems in, that we're looking at in the esophagus and the cardiovascular system that are currently the source is a quantum well device related to the superluminescent diode. Now, most of the in vivo data and all the high-resolution data was done with a mode 
uh, Kerlin's mode lock chromium phosphorite laser, which had a bandwidth of approximately 180 nanometers. Unfortunately, this isn't a clinically viable source because it's too complex and expensive for routine clinical use. Uh, with respect to resolution, the axial resolution with, with OCT is dependent on co the coherence length, which is dependent on the bandwidth of the source. The broader the bandwidth, the higher the resolution in the axial direction. So you can see that if your bandwidth is um, sufficiently broad, this is at 4 microns and we're approaching 1.6 microns, you can get true subcellular level imaging. And the next slide shows its relevance to oncology. Not only can you identify dividing cells, which may not be of that much interest in cardiology, but we can reconstruct 3D volumes of cells identifying. Because if you just take a cross section, you don't know if a cell is small because you're cutting it at the end or because you've actually cut through it. So by being able to reconstruct the 3D volume, you have a better idea of the oncologic potential of the sites. Why aren't we imaging at four microns for our catheter-based system? And it has to do with the transverse resolution. The transverse resolution is basically dependent on the lens or the confocal parameter. When you're up above 10 microns, your confocal parameter is on the order of two to three millimeters, so that over the distance for imaging, you don't get, it's almost a collimated beam. When you try to get a resolution down about five uh, microns, what happens is your beam focus falls off very rapidly, and actually at uh, five microns, the confocal parameter is 50 microns. So in order to do, to match the transverse to the axial resolution, you really need to scan the focus in a manner analogous to confocal microscopy. Um, I said we match them, and it's actually two to one ratio. We use uh, the transverse resolution is twice the axial resolution. The acquisition systems. So the, the acquisition rate is determined almost exclusively by how fast you can change the optical path length in the reference arm. Initially, this was done with a Galvo, um, but it's at very slow speeds associated with it. Newer modalities I'd like to discuss in more detail. Um, one way that this was done was through by stretching the fiber with a piezoelectric crystal, which increased the uh, path length, but was associated with a variety of problems, including polarization mode dispersion, hysteresis. The crystal broke down pretty frequently, and also it required a huge amount of voltage for a clinical setting. Um, this particular fi modality was uh, developed by the Russians first. One of the current modalities we use is a scanning optical delay line, which was developed by uh, two students who were in the lab at the time, Brett Boma and Gary Turney. And it's really very cute in a lot of ways. What happens is light from the reference arm is shined on a grating. Um, the light is then shined on a tilted mirror. The Fourier transform of a linear phase ramp in the frequency domain results in an optical group delay in the time domain. The light is reconstituted on the grating. And by changing the angle of the mirror, you change the optical group delay. Now the reason this is, the things that are attractive about this are, we need a phase delay, that's how we eliminate our one over F noise, it's basically our carrier signal. And where this light shines relative to the axis of the mirror controls the phase delay. The group delay is controlled by the angle of the mirror. And group velocity to dispersion, which is important with light, can be controlled by controlling the distance of this lens from the mirror and the grating. So it allows us that to be controlled without the addition of a prism. Uh, the signal is converted to volta voltage. A bandpass filter removes the 1 over F noise in the DC signal. It then undergoes demodulation where the carrier frequency, the Doppler shift, is removed. The user interface looks, it's small, it looks a lot like uh, an ultrasound system and data can be displayed in either a digital or super VHS format. And it's either linear or polar coordinates, depending on what you want. So the future issues are penetration, which we would like to increase. It's currently at two to three millimeters. Increase the data acquisition rate, which is probably pretty straightforward. You always want more resolution. Human studies are underway. And combinations with spectroscopies, and I'd just like to show you a couple of these.
first point I want to make with this slide is when we say increased penetration, we're talking about increased imaging penetration, not necessarily increased light penetration, and this illustrates this point. These are images of uh, atherosclerotic aortic plaque done with a low and high resolution source, so you're just increasing the bandwidth. But the total power, median wavelength, confocal parameter, and dynamic range were kept constant. And you can see that penetration was greater at the higher resolution. And what this likely reps represents is you're taking all those backscatterers and tightening them up in a sharper point spread function. So it's an issue of contrast. So though the photon penetration is probably close to identical in the two different sets, the actual imaging penetration is greater at the higher, at the broader bandwidth. You can also do Doppler just like you can with ultrasound, and this is done in vivo in the rabbit ear artery, and you can define flow velocities to a very sharp degree, and a lot of this work has also been done by Joe Isa out of the Cleveland Clinic. This, first of all, is a backwards slide, I apologize, but it's also um, not cardiovascular tissue, but one is, there's a variety of forms of spectroscopy you can use with OCT but one of them is this polarization sensitive imaging. One of the first changes you get in osteoarthritis is change in the collagen. Collagen is very highly organized and it also turns out to be polarization sensitive. So when we change the plane, this is normal cartilage, when we change the plane of polarized light from the source, you can see that the backscattering intensity changes at the same site. So this area is polarization sensitive. In early osteoarthritis, the collagen breaks up even before you lose width and you lose this polarization sensitivity. It just becomes uniform as a function of the, the incident light. So in conclusion, OCT represents an attractive technology for intravascular cardiac imaging. Um, First, I'd like to disclose that Jim and I, along with Eric Swanson, founded Coherent Diagnostic Technology. Uh, this has been disclosed to the proper authorities at Harvard, MGH, and MIT, and no conflict is deemed to exist. Uh, my collaborator for five years, you guys probably know him, is James Fujimoto. Um, these guys, this is an older side, Gary Turney and Brett Boma, were very important in the early development of the high speeds non-transparent tissue systems, and they're now at Wellman Labs. Steve's just graduated and Costas Petrus. Steve did a lot of the work on developmental biology and guiding surgery, and Costas has done a lot of the cancer work. We also work with Neil Weissman of Georgetown. Our pathologist a while back had been James Southern, and Eric Swanson is a co-inventor of OCT, who's now at CDT. And Jim and I are funded by the NIH, Whitaker Foundation, Navy, and Air Force. Thank you. Any questions? What is the uh, 190 dB of dynamic range? How does that 190 dB uh, noise. Um, you take the noise, but you subtract out the autocorrelation function and the maximum signal. And what's the maximum signal off derived from? Reflected off of a mirror. So in tissue, you're really not getting a hundred. No, in tissue, in tissue, you don't really get a hundred. You don't need all that dynamic range. But where you do need it, the answer to your question is yes and no. And the reason is that dynamic range means penetration. And that's because deep into tissue, you become photon limited. And so though at the surface of the tissue, you're exactly right, you don't need a dynamic range of 109 decibels. The difference in penetration between 90 decibels and 109 decibels is at least 50%. What is the origin of the echoes? In ultrasound, it's a acoustic impedance mismatch. What is it in oh, it's CT? It's very similar. It's, it, it's a combination of things, but instead of the bulk modulus, it's the refractive index mismatch. So it's a combination of the mismatch between refractive indices and the size and shape of the particle. But it, there's a lot of analogy between OCT and ultrasound in that way. There are exceptions, actually. I should have shown you an example. OCT penetrates very well through calcified tissue because the bulk modulus is obviously affected by the density of the tissue, whereas a refractive index, depending on how it's brought together, may not be that dramatically affected.
No, the, um, you have to match the transverse and axial resolution. To some degree, it's a two to one ratio. So if you're imaging at 10 microns, you want a, a transverse resolution of 20 microns. So the transverse resolution is dependent, just you're basically focusing to that spot size. Now, the problem is that um, if you have a very short confocal length, so, uh, you're going to fall off focus very rapidly. So if your spot size is 5 microns, then your confocal parameter is 50 microns. So basically, you're, you're off focus very quickly into the tissue, whereas at 10 microns or, or above, you're, up, you're over 2 millimeters, and you don't have to adjust the focus. So if you want to image at 4 microns, you need to scan the focus while you're imaging in order to keep the spot size match to the axial resolution. Does that make sense? It's, yeah, it's very similar. You still have a lens. It's a relatively simple lens. It's just a grin lens, but you need a lens to focus it. A prism or a mirror or something, a light directing device. Two sensors. I think we did one experiment where we sent it through the same. Um, you get it's a single mode fiber, so you blow off a lot of power by doing it that way. And we didn't have powerful enough lasers to waste that much energy. Did you find it difficult? Uh, no, it's not that. It's you mean through the catheter, through the free space coupling. Uh, no, you have, you know there are issues you have to deal with throughout the catheter in terms of reflection, but that part isn't that big of a problem. Can you tell us what the status of the clinical trials are and what the expected commercial introduction date um, would be in what field in cardiology? Yes. Uh, yeah, we don't have any intention in ourselves of building an intravascular catheter because of the high risk of and liabilities associated with it. We're pursuing, and it's just a side issue for us, some work in joints and in the esophagus and a couple of, in the female reproductive tract for interest. The coherent diagnostic technologies, on the other, other hand, is aggressively pursuing that, and it should have a commercial device out. Um, I can't give you an exact time frame. But we assume that anyway they would produce it far faster than we would. So this would be a year or two years or five years? I mean, I it's not five years. I, mean, I would speculate 18 months, but that's a guess. But things are, I mean, there's a reasonable chance it'll hit that. The question which I would like to know is that uh, was did you find any kind of wavelength dependence? Yeah, actually, that's a very good question. I should have slow, shown that a slide on that. There's optical windows. There's a variety of reasons why that had a, things that needed to be done to image a non-transparent tissue. Like you need a lot of dynamic range, but one of the most important was to find the appropriate optical window where you didn't get a lot of absorption and scattering. And it turns out that at 1,300 nanometers, you're still below the water peak at 1,500 nanometers, but you've missed the visible light spectrum. There's a little bit of a fat absorption around the 1,000, 1,100, but 1,300 is good. The other possibility is in the region of 1,800 for some applications, because even though you get a slight amount of water absorption out there, scattering is much lower. And we haven't done it quantitatively because it's a difficult study to do quantitatively, but it looks like you probably will be okay at 1,800 nanometers also. Walking distance to uh, achieve uh, a few micron resolution with this system. The um, the working when you say working distance penetra I'm going to say I'm in front of the tissue because working distance through saline, for instance, or through air is can be very long. The, it varies from tissue to tissue. The sharper you, the lower you get, the quicker you fall off because it's the same problem associated with confocal microscopy. Now, we have generated in-tissue resolutions of four microns. And um, I don't really, how far down we can go is not clear. Ultimately, 
theoretically you're limited by the diffraction limit just like you are with confocal microscopy which is in the range of 100 nanometers but from a theoretical standpoint whether you're going to get overwhelmed with multiple scattering or not or have problems with maintaining the focus in highly scattering tissue we're just going to have to see as we go down Sure. Uh, regarding your results on polarization dependence, uh, did you try also the circular polarization? This, it, because the, the, the coupling of uh, electromagnetic radiation is mostly with the materials is dependent on polarization. Right. The, um, the OCT source actually is elliptically polarized currently. We're linearly polarizing it. Now, we weren't using the laser and probably you are going to get a little, you're going to end up with an elliptically polarized source anyway unless you correctly couple it through the fiber. The um, issue as to whether this is birefringent affecting linear polarization or differences in orthogonal states, one of the reasons why we image that tissue straight up and down is if this was, and it had originally been thought that this was birefringence, is if those layers were birefringence and just change in the phase, you wouldn't have them if you stand it straight up and down. And so by standing it straight up and down, I mean at least a component of it is just diff filtration of orthogonal states. 